So yes, uh, we'll be continuing with our topic, uh, the holiness of God. And uh, if anyone has any doubts or you want to clarify anything, you know, you can uh, just flash that symbol over there, you know, which is available for raising the hand. Or you can, you know, type something in the chat, a question in the chat, and then we could address that. So please feel free to do that anytime during the class while it's going on. Um, so we looked a little bit at the holiness of God. OK, we are. We have uh, Jefina raising her hand. Uh, so yes, please go ahead with your question. Yeah, uh, I don't know whether it is uh, very related to what we are looking on. But while I'm listening to the class, I, I had this question like, uh, uh, is there a difference between uh, holiness and righteousness? Or it's just the same word? Yeah. Um, Righteousness is uh, uh, is the right standing that we have, you know, uh, before God, where God looks upon us as uh, being without flaw, uh, being acceptable in His eyes. So um, it's it's the it's the position that we have before Him. It's a position of right standing. So you could say maybe it's a positional thing, uh, righteousness where now we are acceptable, uh, where now he looks upon us as not having any um, sin or flaw or uh, lack, because we all fell short of the mark, right? Uh, his standards were here, and we all fell short of that. But now, uh, because of we, we are now clothed in Christ's righteousness, he now regards us having reached the required standard. So it's a positional thing, I would say. Um, now. Holiness, uh, on the other hand, um, is so a person who is um, not only just positionally righteous, but is also in his uh, actions and his thoughts and his lifestyle is trying to live in that righteousness, they would reflect God's beauty, which is called holiness. So, um, Positionally, at the time of salvation, we have all been brought to that position of right standing with him, where he no longer is, is looking upon us with judgment, but now he is looking upon us as accepted. He is at peace with us. He is in shalom with us. He no longer is against us, but for us. So positionally, we have all arrived there at the, at the point of salvation. But how are we living? Are we living in that righteousness? Um, thinking in a way a righteous person should think? Are we doing things daily that a righteous person should do? If we are, in fact, making every attempt by the help of the Holy Spirit to live in that position of right standing with Him, if we are acting it out in, in, in our thoughts, in our actions, then we start looking like Him. We start sounding like Him. And uh, that is God's beauty. Another word for God's beauty is holiness. So how would I, you know, so if if righteousness is the standing we have, then what is holiness? I don't know, it's just the it's a it's a reflection of him. It's a it's his, it's something that has to do with him. It's a quality of his, and we are kind of uh, reflecting that. And that would be called holiness uh, as far as we are concerned. I would probably have to think more about it and come up with the correct English words to express what I'm trying to say. But I hope you were able to at least catch a little bit of what I have been saying. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, if, yeah. If anyone else has any doubts or you want to you know clarify anything, you can please go ahead. And like I have said, um, sometimes I may not be able to give a very um, you know correct answer off the top of my head. Uh, but I can always get back to you. You know, um, I'll post the answer in the stream page uh, once I have um, you know the scripture references to back it up and all of that. So um, if if any answer is highly unsatisfactory, uh, don't worry. You know, I will uh, look up the necessary verses and get back to you. You know, in such cases. So please do feel free. You know, to ask your doubts if you have any. So because of God, uh, because of who God is, uh, we have a responsibility uh, towards him uh, in 
not trampling upon this holiness that he is sharing with us, not trampling upon this righteousness which he has so freely given us, you know, uh, but to honor him and to treat this righteousness as a privilege because Christ's righteousness has just been freely given to us. We didn't do anything to earn it. Uh, it was just, we, it, it's a robe which was just, you know, we were clothed in that robe of righteousness. And now when God looks at us, he looks at the righteousness of Christ. He doesn't look at us, um, at our imperfections because he knows that we love him and we are working towards cooperating with him. We do want to overcome these things and not continue living in them. We He knows that now we really... Uh, uh, wish to bring glory to his name. So he's being patient and he goes on looking at this robe of righteousness in which we are clothed. So we need to be very careful how we are wearing it, how whether we are honoring what we have been given, this privilege which we have been given. And uh, so uh, when we pray, in fact, this is the way Jesus taught us to pray. And this is what he says to us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. If someone could please read out for us, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So we first of all begin by saying, uh, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. May your name always be held holy by us, by everyone, in fact. May it be held holy uh, because this is a name that has been given to us, you know, for our benefit. And may we hold it with reverence. May it be held in a holy manner by us. Uh, to put it in another way, uh, if we could read out Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. Exodus 20, verse 7. Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Okay, uh, so NKJV would say, you shall not profane the name of the Lord. To put it more simply, you know, in, in the way NIV puts it in our, in our modern language, do not misuse the name of the Lord. Do not um, bring dirt. Do not throw dirt on the name of the Lord, you know. And how do people do that? They misuse and profane the name of the Lord, basically by their actions, by not living in the way God wants. Uh, so which is what happened with the case of the Israelites on many occasions. And uh, we see one example of that in Exodus chapter 36, verses 20 to 23. Look at the way God uh, you know, regards this whole thing, this whole event. Uh, so if we could go to, um, oh no, so sorry, it's not Exodus, it's Ezekiel. Uh, yeah, Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 20 to 23. Ezekiel 36. 20 to 23, if someone could read out. I know it's a bit of a, lo a long passage, but just focus on how the people treat his name and what his response is towards the way they treat his name. Okay, so let's read here. Yeah. Miss, verse 36 chapter? 20 to 23. When they came to the nations, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said of them, these are the people of the Lord, and yet they have gone out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations wherever they went. Uh, 22 and Therefore, 23. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations shall, sh shall, shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. Okay. God wants to be hallowed in us before the eyes of the world. If we 
hold his name with reverence if we behave and act in a way which will bring glory to his name then the uh, people the world will recognize that he is someone who deserves uh, you know honor that he is someone who deserves to be worshiped and treated with reverence if we ourselves his people if we ourselves are not hallowing holding up his name and if we are breaking his commandments and uh, uh, living in a way that goes against his wishes then the people will think okay fine this god of the christians is not really worthy of worship you know so uh, so god says i must be hallowed you know uh, in the eyes of the world and for that to happen you people must represent me correctly so if you yourselves are living in the wrong way and if you are going against my will what's the impression that it would create it would make people think that oh okay this god is not really worthy of worship and so god says you know um, even if it involves having to punish you even if it involves having to uh, bring judgment upon you i will do it because i will bring you to a point where you will indeed treat me with respect that i deserve then the world will see that i am someone uh, who deserves honor and they will recognize that i am holy 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 threefold i'm completely holy and i will never lower my standards and humanity is expected to rise to that standard through jesus through the work of the cross you know with the help of the holy spirit so um when we uh, refuse to do that uh, it's like we are actively making an attack on his holiness because this word that we used in the, in the nkjv it would be the word profaning my holy name in um, niv which tries to use simpler english it you know says misusing the name of the lord uh, uh, but uh, what is the actual word used over there the hebrew word that is used over there it is the exact word which is used also in isaiah 53 <coughs> verse 3 uh, you know if we could go to isaiah 53 uh, sorry verse 5 yeah isaiah 53 verse 5 you know the one we are all very familiar with um yeah isaiah 53 5 if someone could read out Isaiah chapter fifty three was five, but he was pierced for our transgressions; he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. The very first portion of the verse it says he, yeah, he was pierced. It's like you take a knife and you stab with it, you pierce with it. Now that's an act of aggression, right? Ah, uh, so that exact word. piercing is the verse that is yeah, the is the word that is used over here in your ezekiel 36 20 to 23 where it says they pierced so if you were to you know, literally translate you would be saying they are piercing my holy name they are stabbing at it um, they are aggressively going against what that name stands for okay so it's an active act of rebellion uh, so when you and i sin when we even knowing what is right when we deliberately choose to uh, sin god doesn't just see it as you know oh an act of weakness you know we are living in this imperfect world and life is tough and sometimes you have to compromise no he does not look at it in that sense he sees what we are doing as an active act of aggression where we are you know stabbing at his name stabbing at what he is standing for and you know saying you know i am opposing you I know who you are. I know what your standards are, but I am deliberately choosing to attack, to rebel. So it's a very serious thing um, in God's eyes. Uh, we can never look at our sin as just a weakness, as an adjustment that has to be done because we are living in a you know difficult world. No, He sees it as an active act of aggression against Him. against who he is because he is holy he is perfect he cannot tolerate you know a sin which is what habakkuk you know <laughs> recognizes in uh, i'm very sorry you kids this um, bad allergy that's <clears throat> been kind of building up since last night <clears throat> habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13 if someone could read out habakkuk 1 13 
uh you know i'm and i'm i'm glad to have jeffina <laughs> reading uh, but we, if we could also have others reading you know just so that i will i will know that you guys are still there and that you're still you know listening uh so yeah you, jeffina you can go ahead but you know if we could have other people also just reading out it would kind of you know let me know that there are people actually watching and uh, listening to the teaching yeah go ahead can i know the chapter again as habakuk uh chapter 1 verse 13 okay habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13 your eyes are too pure to look on evil you cannot tolerate wrong why then do you tolerate the treacherous why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves okay so habakkuk over here in this um, verse is is confused he knows that god is holy <clears throat> he knows that god cannot tolerate um any wrong at all and so he says lord why are you def- you know delaying justice why are you you know tolerating what these wicked people are doing and then of course that's an entire topic by itself and um, we would need to do a st- study of habakkuk to understand why god allowed the delay in the justice and all of that but the point that he makes is that the thing which he recognizes about god's character is that he says your eyes are too pure to look on evil you cannot tolerate wrong so that is something that we need to recognize that god can never lower his standards he will, he will never lower his standards and he will never tolerate what is wrong he will be patient he will wait for us to repent he will um, you know uh, it he is long suffering is the you know nkjv word so he will for a long time he will suffer and be patient and endure um the things that we are doing you know the, this this acts of piercing at his uh, name and his holiness he will tolerate it uh, hoping that we will change our ways because his uh, mercy is supposed to lead us to repentance uh, but if we continue to resist you know uh, there would be punishment there would be judgment uh, so he is a god who cannot tolerate wrong and that is why uh, it says you know in ezekiel chapter 43 verse 7 and in other places that he will only dwell wherever his name is being hallowed where be where it is being held with with reverence with respect uh, where it is being held holy only in such places he chooses to dwell um so maybe we could look at ezekiel chapter 43 verse 7 if we could have someone read out ezekiel 43 verse 7 please Ezekiel forty three verse seven. Yes. He said, "Son of man, this is the place of my throne, and the place for the soles of my feet. This is where I will live among the Israelites for ever. The people of Israel will never again defile my holy name, neither they nor their kings by their prostitution and the funeral offerings for their kings at their death." Okay. So, um, he God speaks of a future time. when uh, you know the there are a few a remnant who will choose to repent and return to him and those people he you know he will honor them because they will be that that small portion of israel who finally choose to come back to him and uh, live according to his ways and he says this is the place of my throne this is the place for the soles of my feet this is where i will dwell this is where i will establish myself this is where you know i will do all that i have promised for my people so um if we you know in our homes in our own personal lives if we choose to be a people who are not defiling his holy name then he will place the soles of his feet in our lives symbolically speaking uh his throne will be you know uh, in our lives imagine you no know, um 
if your home is the place where the souls of his feet are resting wow what a privileged person you would be i mean the everything would be would be easier in the sense uh, you know um, uh, because your uh, his favor is upon you and your family uh, it would be so much easier to go through the trials of life trials will anyway come you know because as long as we are in the world trials would be there but now because he is on your side and there are no blockages between you and him um uh, his blessings his victory his deliverance can flow freely into your situations and your family uh, so we all i'm sure would like his throne to be in our home we would like the soles of his feet to be resting in our uh you know um in our little space in our lives okay so um uh so therefore it is very important uh that we choose to not defile his name because among such people he would prefer to dwell among such people he would prefer to make his habitation and um, just to use one uh, you know new testament example of this um Matthew chapter eighteen verses eighteen to twenty. If uh, you know, this is a practical example of how this works. You know, so Matthew chapter eighteen, eighteen to twenty. If we could have someone read out, please. Matthew chapter eighteen, verse eighteen to twenty. I tell you the truth: whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. Okay. Um. Now, um, this is a portion of a passage, so obviously we would need to know the entire passage to know what uh, is being talked about over here. um here jesus is talking about his people people who have now become his followers you know people who are um, who have chosen to um you know may uh, to place their allegiance with him you know now they have made a commitment saying lord you are our master we are going to be following you so um when such people fall away and disciplinary action has to be taken so uh, the elders of the church would come together and they would decide what to do they would take different various steps on you know trying to bring that person back into the fold and stuff like that so in that context jesus is speaking and he says whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven so if you in a godly manner decide okay we need to take action against this person and ask him to stop coming to the church for a few months until he has spent time with the lord and genuinely repented and given up those things that he is doing till then we will choose not to allow him back into the fellowship uh, so if if you make a decision like that what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven i will back up your the decision that you guys have taken i will back up uh, you know uh, whatever you have chosen so whatever you bind whatever you lose i will back up whatever uh, you know uh, decision uh, you have taken because he says truly i tell you you know wherever he says truly i tell you it's like you know he's saying 100% 101% i am saying what i am saying so truly i tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for it will be done for them by my father in heaven for where two or three gather in my name there am i with them so if these people are gathering in his name if they are taking the disciplinary action in a way that honors his name if they are taking the disciplinary action in a way that is in sync with the way with god's character with the way he approaches these situations so if they are doing it in that manner because they are honoring his name uh, upholding the holiness of his name he will be there with them in that and he will give his full backing to them you know in that thing which they are uh, doing okay so um, so uh, so over here we have an example where some action has to be taken in the church in that fellowship um, regarding some matter so we can apply this to all other areas of life in any area of your life your career you know your workplace uh, wherever you're working you know whichever office you're working at 
uh, in your relationships, uh, you know, um, with your family members or your relationship with other people, you know, uh, your relatives, uh, the your friends, uh, in your uh, finances, in the way you handle your money, in every area of life, if you are living in his name, upholding the holiness of his name and living in a way that honors him, then he is very much there in that and he will act on your behalf. His full, you have his full backing. Okay, so that's the promise that he makes. So where does he prefer to dwell? He will dwell in the place where his name is being honored, where the holiness of his name is being hallowed, where it is being held as an, as an honorable thing and being treated with reverence. So um, this is the kind of uh, kind of places, these are the kind of situations in which he chooses to habit, where he forms his dwelling place. Uh, so, so we need to be careful about every area of our life so that he can inhabit and dwell all areas of our life, you know, and operate in it freely, however he wishes. Um, now, let's come to another aspect, which is also, you know, equally interesting and nice. Uh, now, these are all, you know, many of these things are things that we're already familiar with. Uh, it's just that as we are going through this again, you know, almost like a revision, um, there would be certain aspects that God would touch upon our hearts. So for different uh, people, different passages, uh, different portions of these lessons will, you know, become uh, significant depending on you know, their situations. So uh, just to cover another aspect of his holiness, uh, let's look at Psalm chapter 60, uh, verse 6 where God makes a promise okay, to, um, to the people of Israel. Psalm chapter 60, verse 6. Psalm chapter 60, verse 6. God has spoken from his sanctuary. In triumph, I will parcel out Shechem and measure of the valley of Sukkot. Yes. Um, God has spoken from his sanctuary. The, uh, you know, in our previous session, we looked at that word Kodesh, and that word Kodesh um, literally means holy. Um, so that word Kodesh is used for God's temple. It's used for his sanctuary. It's also just used for him, his character, his holiness. So, um, which is why if you are looking at your um, NKJV, it will be translated that verse Psalm 66 will be translated as God has spoken in his holiness. He has spoken in his Kodesh. On the other hand, if you're reading NIV, it will say God has spoken uh, from his sanctuary. He has spoken from his Kodesh. Same word, same word Kodesh is used for the character of holiness and also the actual physical building, uh, the sanctuary which is supposed to be a holy place. So uh, which is why we have two different translations going on. But basically, what is the essence of what is being said over here? When he speaks, whether he is speaking out of his holy sanctuary or whether he's just speaking out of his holy character, he is speaking out of his holiness. So he will not make uh, promises the way our politicians make promises. They, they make promises just to sound grand, just to make us feel good for five minutes. But they don't keep their promises. I've at least a lot of politicians. Uh, if you know good ones, that's excellent. You know, um, you're very privileged. Uh, but then most politicians, at least what we, we see, are people who will say things um, without really meaning them. But whenever God opens his mouth, he speaks out of his holy place or out of his holy character he is literally speaking out of that holy 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 you know that threefold perfection so he's never going to say anything which he's not going to fulfill completely in all of its completeness so here he's making a promise to these people these israelites and he says i will divide shechem and measure out the valley of sukkoth Okay, these are all places which the Israelites have, at the moment have lost. Uh, they don't have those particular areas anymore, territories. Uh, it has they, Those areas have been taken over by the Edomites. 
and God is making a promise in his holiness. And he is saying, you know what? It will come back to you. This territory will come back to you and you will be able to divide it among your families, you know, and allot these different areas to the different families, you know, according to all the mosaic laws that are given uh, on how to divide the territory and all of that. So he's promising and saying, you know, you know what I'm telling you, I'm promising in your in my holiness that these territories will come back to you. And uh, if we were to look at the introduction of Psalm 60, we kind of get a background of this entire psalm and we get to know that God, in fact, did keep his promise. And, um, you know, these these portions, these territories actually uh, do come back to them. Uh, we get to know that um, uh, Joab, right? Yeah, correct. It's Joab. If you go look at the introduction of Psalm 60, you get to know that uh, even though they were defeated by the Edomites and they, you know, lost some uh, some of the territories, uh, Joab is able to go back later to the Valley of Salt. And over there, he, he and his army, they successfully strike down 12,000 Edomites. And they're able to take back the territory. And in honor of that occasion, now the psalm is being written. So in the psalm, we discover that God had made a promise to them in his holiness. And he actually keeps it. They're able to get back these territories you know, uh, on this particular occasion. So. Um, if we were to look at Psalm 89, verses 35 and 36, um, if someone could read out that, Psalm 89, verses 35 and 36. Psalm chapter 89, verse 35 and 36. Once for all, I have sworn by my holiness, and I will not lie to David, that his line will continue forever and his throne endure before me like the sun. So here God says, I'm swearing, I'm formally making a promise. Um, the act of uh, swearing, you know, um, in a legal sense is where you know you're saying uh, if i go back on my word may i be punished some you know in that sense so here god is formally legally making a sworn statement and he is saying i will not lie to david you know i will see to it that he has uh, a successor on the throne and we see that fulfilled in the uh, messiah so uh, god uh, swears his promises in holiness so which means those promises will be fulfilled and so these verses are a great comfort to us you know uh, we all have unanswered prayers in our lives and there are occasions where god has given us verses he's given us you know promises and said hold on to this because i am going to fulfill it and we've been praying and we've been waiting and we have not yet seen it come through and sometimes we wonder did God really mean what he said? But, you know, we need to understand that when he opens his mouth, when he speaks, he speaks in his holiness. So he will not compromise. Uh, he will not go back on what he said. He will not lie. He will not deceive. So we can always trust his word. So each time we open the Bible and we start reading the promises that God has written down over there, we need to keep in mind that these are words which are coming out of the mouth of a holy God who will never go back on his word. So we have this assurance that because he is speaking in his Kodesh, in his holiness, he's speaking out of his holy place, you know, he will not uh, lie to us. That gives us uh, confidence that uh, his that our prayers will be answered in his way and in his perfect timing. Uh, now, coming to another aspect of his holiness. Holiness decorates so many aspects of, um, of the things which pertain to him. For instance, um, you know, I'll just Psalm 93, verse 5, it talks about how holiness decorates uh, God's house. Your statutes, Lord, stand firm. Holiness adorns your house for endless days. So um, holiness decorates his, the house of God. Holiness decorates the hill of God. 
you know, God's holy hill. Psalm uh, chapter 2, verse 6. Psalm 3, verse 4. Uh, God's um, holiness uh, decorates his temple, um, which is Habakkuk 2.20, Psalm 11.4. Uh, his holiness decorates his throne, which would be Psalm 47, verse 8. All these things are there in your notes, OK? Um, so there are so many verses which talk about uh, the holiness of God. And then it says that even in the tabernacle, all those things over there in the tabernacle and the people in the tabernacle, uh, they're all uh, decorated with his holiness. I'm just using the word decorated simply because it's a simpler word than adorn. You know, most of us may not be familiar with this word adorn, A-D-O-R-N. So it's, he's, um, you know, decorating us, beautifying us, you know, with his holiness. So I meant it in that sense. So here you have the holy garments which the priests wear in Exodus 28, verse 2 and 4. Um, the holy garments that the, that the priests are wearing, that is decorated with his holiness. Um, and then uh, the anointing oil that they use over there, the vessels which are used in the tabernacle, they all are, um, are adorned, covered with his holiness. They're set apart. The incense which was used over there in the tabernacle to offer before God, that was holy incense. Um, it was incense which has been uh, which has been decorated with his holiness. So it cannot be used for uh, other normal purposes. And uh, in fact, we we see you know God says in His Word, uh, if anyone tries to misuse that incense for normal, ordinary, everyday things, uh, then in fact He would punish them for it. So in the same way, uh, the body of Christ is also decorated with his holiness. Uh, and um, for that, we will look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Don't you know that you yourself are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred and you are the temple. Okay, so um, God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. So here it's talking about the entire body of Christ the worldwide church of god um, that is god's temple uh, a little local church where you have maybe you know 500 600 people meeting that also is a portion of his temple of his uh, of his body and that is sacred even an individual believer just one single person uh, who you know is con carrying the presence of god uh, that person also, because he is carrying the presence of God in him, he is like a temple uh, for God. Uh, so he too has been made holy. So all of us who carry God's presence in us, uh, we are his temple. And it says, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred. And uh, so... We need to be very careful how we treat our human body and uh, also how we behave as a church, you know, as a local body, because that little church, we are carrying all the members, the congregation, we are carrying his presence and we must do it in a way that is honorable. We must hallow, hold his hold him as somebody to be uh, uh, to be revered and honored. So we should be hallowing and holding his name in holiness, uh, you know, in, in our conduct. Uh, because uh, just like he said, even in the Ezekiel passage, God will not tolerate it when we misuse his name, when we pierce and stab at his name, you know. So uh, his holiness is something that, that should be taken seriously. Uh, so that is uh, from our side. That's our responsibility. We must hallow and hold his name as holy and treat him, you know, in a worthy manner. 
the other side to it is when people from the outside attack the church when they try to harm us uh, when they try to uh, destroy us god takes that very seriously uh, because uh, those people are touching the apple of his eye we are very very precious to him there would be an instant reaction you know the term apple of the eye uh, you know you, you would have heard sermons about that um, that's just basically you know the the black portion um, of the eye uh, you know if anything comes near the eye immediately immediate instant reaction we immediately close our eyes come to the defense of that very sensitive part uh, so um, so when god says you know that we are the apple of his eye uh, it means if anything tries to touch us or harm us immediate instant reaction you know response god will uh, is there to shield uh, but the sad thing is that many of people instead of staying under his covering they'll go out there out of the covering of his wings and do what they want and they end up in a lot of trouble uh, so in on most occasions um, yeah, we don't stay under the covering but if we are under his covering his protection is there of course sometimes he willfully permits trials to come into our lives uh, but then he has his own purposes for that and he very carefully monitors those problems and difficulties because he never wants us to be overwhelmed he wants us to be built up through that trial not to be crushed by it never now he does he has no interest in crushing us or making us miserable he always allows these negative things to strengthen us make us stronger and uh, cause us to shine more in him you know so um so uh, we can have this assurance that when people are attacking the church when they are taking action against us when they are trying to persecute us when they are trying to destroy us god takes notice he will be there to uh, you know uh, uh, protect us and uh, shield us persecution will be there um, god does allow it because you know uh, like god says like jesus says when the whatever is done to the master will be done to the followers so uh, if the master was persecuted if the master was uh, you know wrongly blamed then yes those things will happen to you as well but there is these things will always be uh, under god's control he will only allow things that he wants to allow so people cannot randomly uh, you know bring harm to believers no god monitors god sees to it uh, that you know things are done in a way uh, that is in, a, in accordance with his will because he has a higher plan he has a higher purpose he will decide who will be persecuted to what extent he will allow them to be persecuted and he will put a stop to it when you know when they try to go beyond that no one can touch god's people god's church beyond uh, what god allows uh, so the evil one you know cannot randomly do whatever he wants of course there's the other um, side to it where if we choose to step out of his will and you know go out of his covering then yes bad things could happen to us you know even though he does not want it so uh, so if anyone tries to destroy god's temple god will destroy that person uh, you know when the time comes so it's a dangerous thing to attack the church and to ill treat the church of god um <laughs> so sorry so sorry um yes um coming to god's stand on sin maybe we can look at uh okay psalm 119 verse 104 maybe psalm 119 uh, 104 psalms 119 104 through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Uh, David says, I hate every false way. I hate every wrong path. Why? Because God says in Zechariah 8, 17, all these things are what I hate. You know, there's a list of sins that he gives and he says, I hate these things. So God's attitude because of his holiness, his attitude towards sin is that he hates sin of any kind and he expects his followers to have that same feeling regarding sin we should hate it 
we must find it repulsive we must uh, dislike it okay so uh, david says you know even as i'm you know dwelling upon your precepts even as i'm dwelling upon your word and learning your principles i am beginning to gain understanding and therefore now even i hate all the things which you hate so uh, it's something that we grow into because when we are first saved when we first become believers um we still have not yet developed that deep hatred for the things of the world it happens slowly even as we like david we 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 meditate on his precepts and we begin to our mind starts thinking the way he thinks you know it starts getting renewed and so gradually we begin to hate the things which god hates we are uh, thinking gets aligned with his thinking so these are not things which will happen automatically uh, you can't just you know uh, sit lazily in your chair and say oh god will make me holy uh, no it doesn't happen that way um, he expects us to renew our mind uh, to be strengthened in our inner man and all these things happen even as we spend time with him even as we spend time in prayer even as we you know uh, uh, pray in tongues and um, build up our inner person uh, even as we do all of these spiritual exercises that are that need to be done then we will start becoming like him in our nature and then like david we will be able to say yeah i too hate these wrong paths the things which you dislike i also you know dislike and um, if there are things which we don't dislike at the moment and there are sinful things that we love at the moment it would be really help to go very frankly into his presence and place those things in front of him and say lord i can see that the way you feel about this thing and the way i feel about this thing is really um, this big contrast and lord i want to be like you i want to see this thing the way you see it i want to hate it the way you hate it so oh lord even as i cooperate with you you help me to overcome this so by and by you know even as we make a conscious effort to um to overcome that that particular area that we are drawn to that wrong area of sin even as we actively cooperate with the holy spirit you know galatians 5 we walk in step with the spirit and uh, we begin to respond to him rather than respond to the pull of those wrong things then we start becoming like him and then uh, we will develop the divine hatred toward those evil things so it does not happen automatically if we are spiritually lazy and we sit back and say ah okay one day i will hate it it's not going to happen that way we have to consciously renew our mind we have to consciously strengthen our inner man we have to consciously you know strengthen that contact that we have with the lord the lord is always there always present right next to us but we have to reach out and strengthen our contact with him so that we will become more like him so that his nature can flow more and more into us these are all things that we would have to actively do these are all uh, disciplines that we need to um, take on on a day to day basis spiritual laziness does not lead to holiness it doesn't happen just like that automatically uh, and we are doing that why not because it's this heavy burden and responsibility that has been thrust upon us but no because god in his great love wanted to share his beauty with us he wanted us not just to be forgiven a forgiven bunch of sinners like you know one pathetic bunch of uh, um uh, you know dependents on whom you took pity and now like an act of charity or being nice to them no he wanted us to be sons and daughters literally family members not just some charity cases that he's being nice to we, he literally wants us to be part of his household and so he wants to us to become like him so this is a privilege which is being given to us it's not some kind of um, uh, uh, of some imposition that has that is being thrust upon us so holiness is a privilege an honor that we work towards uh, you know because he has already made us righteous in christ so we choose to reflect his beauty um, and uh, we must not look at look upon it as just a headache that we have to end your no not at all okay so his intentions were good when he said be holy as i am holy
Um, OK. Um, just to look at one example, oh, we do not have time. So we will not look at that example. All right, uh, we'll close for the day. And um, uh, next, so we have spent two classes kind of looking at different aspects of God's holiness and understanding who he is. Um, so next class, we will look into in greater detail of why we need to be holy. And once we kind of you know ta have tackled that why we need to be holy, then it will become easier for us to you know, focus on all the rest of this course. Uh, so we'll get into the why of it uh, in our next session. I, I'll just close with a small word of prayer, all right? Um, Lord, we just thank you so much for all the learnings that we you know, uh, had today. I pray that you would continue to remind us of these things so that, Lord, um, we would actually begin to practice these things in our everyday lives. Be with us, oh Lord. No one can become holy on their own. We need your power. And so we pray that you, just like Galatians 5 says, we will walk in step with you. And even as we are walking in step with you, you, O oh Lord, will empower us to um, be like you and live in a way which honors your name. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for holding out till the end. Uh, yeah. So uh, we'll meet again next week. Thank you. Thank you, Kimmel.